How are you? Good. Tell, tell me a little bit about yourself. Who are you? First of all, I'm a civilian. Um, I was born and raised in Calgary. I came to Israel when I was 18. I did the army, I was in the paratroopers, and then I stayed in Israel, you know, fell off of the country, worked in, uh, in high tech, went to the U.S. a couple years ago, did my MBA, moved to New York, launched a startup, and then October 7th happened. And where were you on October 7th? I was in New York. I was actually, for us, it was October 6th. So I was walking back from a Shabbat dinner. We had an amazing week. There was this huge Chabad Sukkot event, like almost like 2,000 people. And I'm walking into my apartment and I start getting these text messages. And it's like, okay, the Hamas breached into Israel. You know, they went past the border. It's like, it happens. What was your relationship to the army at the time? October 6th, not October 7th, October 6th. Yeah. So since I was released in 2012, I've been doing reserve duty every year. Sometimes once, twice, three times a year uh, with the same unit, with the same people. My unit is uh, 551 made up of Sanchanim, Maglan, Udevan, it's like more of a commando unit. And even when I was living not in Israel, I would still come back and do uh, reserve duty. So October 7th is happening, it's unfolding. You get contacted by your unit and you made your way. I bought a ticket before my unit called me. I okay. felt something going on. Texted my dad, I'm like, look, I'm, I'm, I'm coming to Israel. He's like, wait a second, relax, we don't know what this is. I said, Mom, Dad, I'm coming to Israel. And I bought the ticket. A couple hours later, uh, my unit was called to base. Okay, and you, at the time, you have your, your startup, or you still have your startup. You packed that all up, your startups on pause, business brothers. Yeah, I mean, once October 7th happened, my whole life was on pause. I didn't think about anything. Even when I was in Gaza, I had to make a mental switch, which was very hard. I'll think about friends. I'll think about work, not even think about family. Like I was focused on number one, eliminating Hamas, and number two, bringing the hostages back. I wasn't thinking about anything else. And that's what happened until, until I was released. And so you get to Israel, October 8th. Walk me through what happened. You land in Israel. We're, we're in chaos. I was here. Where do you go? What do you do? What do you report to? So I land in Israel, it's 5.30 p.m. on a Sunday, and I want to go to base, but my dad's like, if you don't come say bye to us, I'm going to kill you myself. So I go up north to, to Akko, where my family lives, and give a big hug to my grandpa, go to my parents, grab my gear, it's late, so I sleep there, and first thing in the morning, I give my parents a, a hug, and it was a quick goodbye, because it was, you know, my parents, by the time I got to Israel, they had two other boys in the army, you know, we're three boys. And we're all combat soldiers, we're all on the front line. It's not like, you know, one is in less danger. So having a third boy and saying goodbye to the third boy was uh, was hard for them. But I, I left in the morning, got to base. My unit was like, hey, what are you doing here? Like you were in New York yesterday, now you're here. It was amazing, but within half an hour, I got into my gear and we started training. And where do you fall into the sibling category? Three boys, middle, all this? I have no all this. A lot of pressure. Yeah. And yeah, I'm not, you know, I was paratroopers. My brother was in the Divan, what, what Fauda is based off of. And he also does reserve uh, duty there. So it's very interesting for him. And my younger brother, he's 22. He just got released, you know, last year and it's already back in the army. Can you tell me a little bit about your experience? What it was like before going in, but now reuniting with your unit and uh, preparing whether it was mentally or physically for what is to come. We had chaos from the beginning, just like you did. We didn't know where we were going because our unit specializes in up north. And we knew that a lot of stuff was going on down south in Gaza, but up north was, was unexpected. You know, you would like on October 8th, there was an attack from up north. Um, so we, we were sure we were going up north, but then the West Bank came into place. It was always, as we say in Hebrew, Balagan. We didn't know what was going on. So we started training for everything for up north for down south, for the West Bank. We trained on base, off base. We found an empty school in Israel here that we trained because it looked like something that we could face in, in Gaza. And it, it was weird, you know, like opening and clearing classrooms of, you know, third and fourth grade. We trained inside, outside, at night, in the morning. We were just ready for every single thing. And every day we were told something else. 
you guys are going up north, you're going down south. One day I remember we were in the middle of a drill at that school. They stopped the drill, they told everyone to get on the bus and get their gear because helicopters are waiting for you to go up north. And we're like, okay, like it's happening, let's go. We got to base and it was canceled. And then the next day you guys are going to gas. And then up north again, then like mentally, it was, it was a lot of up and down because you're ready to go, you call your parents, you tell them goodbye, and then you say it's canceled. You do it again and again. I just stopped calling my parents because I didn't know it was real. And then um, we we trained for three weeks total. We were one of the first reserve duty units to fully go into Gaza. Um, and I feel like I did a PhD in Hamas studies. Like we studied every single thing about it, everything. But it was the moment that it became real for you. I got two stops in the face. Uh, the first one was when my middle brother went to base before this all started, when he was called up and said that this is serious. I was back in New York. And the second slap was, um, when we crossed into Gaza by foot, it was, I don't really know how to describe it. It was weird and it was scary and it was, you know, it was powerful and it was like, like this is happening. You know, I, I, I've been doing reserve duty for over 10 years. I've been in the army. I've been on the border of Gaza and Syria and Lebanon. I've been in the West Bank. I've arrested terrorists. I've, I've done a lot of things, but you know, physically going into the, the unknown, not knowing how long you're going to be there for, that's when it became real for me. And it was like, from that second, that's when I made that mental switch of, I love my family, but I'm not thinking about them. My business at that point was the most important thing in my life. I put every ounce of energy in the past year and a half into it. I'm not thinking about it. My friends, I love them. I'm focusing on two things right now. I think that really sharpened my focus when I was inside Gaza. What was your wish? What is your needed mission or ideas? The, the, the overall mission was to eliminate Hamas and bring back the hostages. Those were the two main things that we were focused on. Every day we had, you know, smaller missions to go in clear this house, find weapons here, and, and, and do what we had to do. But overall, those were the two things that the worst were the most important. And not every unit is doing both missions. We are focused on eliminating Hamas more than bringing back the hostages because that just isn't our field of specialty. But everything that we did helped, you know, helped both missions. Can you talk a little bit about you're inside Gaza. What is your day to day? You know, like most people will never be in a war zone, never be in hell like Gaza. Give me as much as you can on what it was like day to day, especially back to that beginning part where you're just walking. There was no day to day. Every day was something different. One day we got an alert that there's a group of 12 terrorists who are coming specifically to our house to kill us. The next day we got an alert that there was a, a, a drone that's going to drop a grenade at 8.30 p.m. The next day a suicide bomber. Every single day was different and we had to adapt to the situation. But to kind of give you a timeline, I don't know when to start because there's no start of the day, but let's say you're guarding at 3 a.m. You, know, you kind of go back to bed for, for an hour and then you wake up at 5 a.m. At 5 a.m. everyone's awake because we know that Hamas likes to attack when the sun is rising and kind of know at the end of the day, at sundown. So at 5 a.m., everyone's awake. We have a patrol going out. Everyone's this du double double posted on the on the on guard duty. And then at around you know seven, when that patrol has come back, half of the people are guarding, half of the people are eating breakfast, and you're switching. Some people like to do what we call a, a sh shower, a Gaza shower. So you take a baby wipe with some you know Purell, some alcohol gel, and just rub each other's backs just to, you know, breathe a bit. Eat. And then we'd do a 9 a.m. another round of guarding and then 11 a.m. a mission and then 12, you know, we would clean our guns and then there'd be alerts all the time so it was unexpected. And then the sundown would come and we knew that Hamas was going to attack them. So we'd prepare ourselves and another patrol and then it was just, it was non-stop all day. And from the beginning, we'd be doing an hour of guard or an hour of guard duty. 45 minutes of sleep and an hour or two hours of guard duties and we just we were like kind of like robots at that, at that time just doing our mission and every day was different 
the houses we went into were marked as houses that were dangerous. They either had weapons inside them, intelligence. They were either the house of a terrorist. We wouldn't just go to any house we wanted to. We wanted specific houses that could be beneficial to us and to the IDF. So whether it was one house, an apartment, a couple apartments, we would clear those apartments in two stages. Number one, we would clear them from any um, high risk uh, threats, which is more, you know, bombs or, or terrorists. And the second thing we would do is we would clear, we would look inside those houses for different clues to terrorism, whether it was Hamas flags, whether it was weapons, whether it was, you know, maps of tunnels, which, which we did find. Um, and then we would just stay, once those houses were clear and safe, we would stay there. We would guard from the house, we would guard outside, and I won't get too, too into it, but um, we would guard from places that gave us a bit of, of an advantage over, you know, the terrorists from where were they coming from? Where were they going to sneak up on us? And we wouldn't stay there for the entire time. You would move pretty often. And you talk about, you know, clearing an apartment. Where, where are the civilians at this point? In, uh, in northern Gaza, there were barely any civilians. At the beginning of the war, the IDF gave them a lot of time, almost three weeks, to go down south for their safety. You know, we, as IDF soldiers, were not focused on civilians. We're actually focused on saving civilian life, whether it's Jewish or Palestinian, and focused only on terrorism. And those Palestinian civilians, they were told that northern Gaza it's now a battleground and you have to move. So we had a few interactions with, with civilians, but most people we faced were, were terrorists. And did you have any moments in the early stages where you felt you were coming close to, let's say, discovering uh, a total that would lead to hostages or, you know, going into a clearing apartment that you felt like this was it? And if so, did you? Did it come to fruition where you were able to find hostages? The, the, the tunnel network is is crazy. It's very big. And the first thing that we do when we see a tunnel is we all go inside because it's either, you know, surrounded with explosives or there's a terrorist waiting inside. Like we, our unit personally wouldn't go into the tunnels. You have a lot of special forces, special units that do that. Um, at the beginning, we found tunnels, we found, we found signs of terrorism, we found a lot of intelligence. We found clues that would lead us to intelligence that helped the, the idea. Mm. So we found stuff in the beginning, by the way. Posted yesterday, we were to read the, the caption, when we weren't physically fighting, I spent a lot of time reflecting. I thought about the missions we did, the things we found, and what they meant. And before every mission, I tried to look for signs of peace or something that would hint to a better future. But every single time, with no exception, the things I found pointed towards the dream to wipe Israel off the map. I believe that the only path to peace is to replace the current leadership with one that loves their children more than they hate us. Which is, I think, a truth that most Jews experience long before October 7th and exacerbated by October 7th. But the beginning part of this is you spent a lot of time reflecting. And you did a, a, lot, a lot of missions. Well, can you tell me an experience, a day, a mission that you've had that has, has, has marked you that you will not forget? Um, and that was, you know, I understand why we're doing this now, not from the point of October 7th Ambassador, but I mean, guys, I understand why this is real. Friday seemed to be the day of attack for Hamas. It seemed to be their, their favorite day. What, uh, do it, you know, close to Shabbat. And um, at the beginning of the war, you know, we're we're five five one. We're we're a big unit. Um, we were our forces were, were were spread out, and we were sitting down in one of the houses. It was you know our break time, and some of us were actually playing cards. And it was like a happy moment. It was like even in all this, you know, this. this this nightmare, there's a couple of smiles going around. All of a sudden on the radio, we hear everyone get to the mosque. We have an Aran. An Aran is a Yehua Rav Nivagai. It means that something happened with a lot of injured. And when we train for this type of thing, the people who are acting as the injured, you know, the soldiers who are being you know, treated as, as, as fake injured, 
they're squirming around, they're moving, they're screaming, and you know, you're trying to treat them, and it's, you're, they're really trying to prepare you for the real thing. So this is what I had in my mind. We have to get to the mosque, because that's what we were told to go, because something happened there. And it's, it's chaos, we start running, we grab the stretchers, and we don't know what happened, but something bad happened. We get there, and there's a ton of soldiers. And basically what happened is that an explosives was uh, remotely detonated by Hamas, and it ended up killing four soldiers and injuring six. And, you know, we're, we're outside this mosque. It's, it's a huge mess. And, you know, you start seeing bodies being taken out on stretchers. There's ones that are covered, which you already know are, are dead bodies. And, and there's ones that you see people with, with no legs. You see people with no armors. The second ago, I was playing cards and laughing with their friends, and now people from my unit, you know, 100 meters away from me, they're, they're, they're either dead or they're injured. And the thing is, is that it was silent. That was the creepy thing. No one was screaming, no one was yelling, because everyone was either dead or unconscious. And for me, that was like, okay, this, this is real. Everyone in this area doesn't hate the Jews or the Israelis. They want to kill the Jews. They don't want us here and they're doing everything they can to destroy us. So that, that, was, that, that was hard for me and eventually we, we went back to, to the apartment because there was a, you know, intelligence that there might be another bomb going off and we wanted less injuries. And it was about 11 p.m. and we hadn't done Kiddush or prayed. And I remember we, we prayed in the dark, like we, um, we, we we prayed Shabbat dinner in the dark, and and I, I it was important for me to do kiddush, and I've never done kiddush in the dark, you know, pitch black and silence. And I I told everyone before the kiddush that what happened today is 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 a big blow. It's a very sad day, and we lost soldiers that didn't need to go. But with that said, we didn't lose them for nothing, and and, and their death is supposed to give us strength. You know, I, I, I felt so much power when I was giving them this speech and even though it was pitch black, I, I, could, I could feel everyone. I did Kiddush and we, we ate in silence, we ate in pitch black and we felt each other and you would hear, you know, like sniffles going around and for me, that's, that's when I realized that we are fighting a, I don't even know what to call them. You know, they're these the barbaric savages who their number one goal is to kill us. That's when I made that 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 switch my mind where there's there's no innocent people in this specific area, none at all. So you go in, you're here, you're in Gaza. When it was the first time you came out, what was that experience like? And then guiding you through like going back. Yeah, I mean, we got out after two and a half weeks, and they went by really quickly. First thing I did was I, you know, we got to the kibbutz we were staying at for the night. It was about, I think, like 12 at night. And I opened my phone and it hadn't been on for two and a half weeks. Again, like, what's that message after what's that message? And Instagram and followers, my phone just like, it froze. It wouldn't work. I'm trying to call my parents and it's calling, but it's not working. And it just, my phone like stopped working. So I grabbed, you know, one of the logistics uh, officers' phones and just called my parents and it still wouldn't go through. So I just called my brother and my brother who, you know, he's in the thought, he's seen terrorists. He's like, he deals with this every day. He's so mentally strong. He just had a kid. He's, he just broke down and for five minutes he was crying. And I like, I felt guilty. You know, and then I, and then I faced on my parents and like, let the family chat. Everyone's crying. I, I felt so bad. I'm like, I was okay, you know, I, I, I smiled sometimes and yeah, you know, I didn't, I didn't like suffer. It was hard. Yeah. Mentally, physically, it was, of course it was hard, but I'm okay. And they just like, they, it, it was hard for me to stay online. So I told them, I told them I had to go. Um, and then the next day the, they were able to come visit us in, in Ashkelon where we were staying. I, I, just, I just felt guilty every single time. That time and the rest of the times I got out for 24, 48 hours, I felt guilty because 
you know that there was a study done that one million parents in Israel don't sleep at night because of the war. And my parents and my and my siblings are part of that. And I just like I felt bad for 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 putting them through this. I told them I'm going to go into Gaza ten more times if I have to. But like I I, I really felt the not that that we didn't have love before, but I I really felt and it was much stronger and. Every person I spoke to, every person I was with, you know, like that the hug, that it was just so much more powerful. And I, uh, I really started to appreciate the small things in life that we take for granted every day. What What did you do for food? You have to stay nourished. Yeah, to operate, right? But what, what was your What was your nutritional plan? Yeah, so I mean, the army has their regular, you know, like uh, ready to eat meals, malakav as we call them, it comes with uh, tuna and beans and corn and pineapple. And it's something that the the army's been using for years. But as reservists, you know, we're not, we're not, you know, everyday soldiers. We brought some extra things, um, you know, like tahina, uh, tahini. We brought, uh, you know, ketchup and sriracha, things to really improve our meals. We found a lot of things, um, the sad things or the expected things, you know, the weapons, the grenades, the RPGs, the, the maps, you know, the, with the terror tunnels. It was it's sad. Houses. Yeah. We, I remember walking into the room of a seven year old and on one side I saw, you know, all like the pink and purple colors, something you'd maybe expect to find that some rooms of, of seven year old girls, on the other side you'd find posters and pictures of terrorists that they were idolizing terrorists at such a young age and you open the closets and you find a a weapon hidden under there or you find some sort of intelligence like you found things that were related to terror in the rooms and also yes of the seven-year-olds so it wasn't um it eventually wasn't surprising I don't know if there's any good things we found uh, but I remember going to one one terrorist's house and he had like a museum under the house and you'd find, you know, these clay pots, 1700s labeled. You'd find, you know, a, a door that was like 500 years old. You find a record played from back in the day. You found a lot of valuable things. And, and we, there's like a rule in the army where even if you're about to destroy the house or blow up the house, you can't steal anything. You can't take anything. Even if that specific, you know, diamond necklace or whatever is about to be destroyed. So no one from our unit took anything that was valuable, unless it was intelligence that we, we passed on. What what are you seeing? Being a person who is live in Gaza, fighting, defending Israel, and what are you seeing online? What's the contrast? Can you share your experience as somebody who's been in, in Gaza and now watching what the world is saying about Gaza, yeah. about Israel on live? During the war, I opened my phone maybe three times, I would film with the GoPro, I'd film every day, I'd write the captions in my journal, and once I'd get out on my 24, 48 hour break, I would have this team who really, really helped me, these you know, amazing, amazing uh, women, and I would just send them all the footage, send them the captions, and they would handle the page. But once I was released and officially mentally ready to come back to the world, I realized that we're, we're, us foot soldiers aren't the only ones fighting the war. You guys, you know, outside of, of, of Gaza or Israel are also fighting a war in the, the, the amount of, of, of hate and the amount of, of posts that are just completely untrue. I, I knew it was there, but I didn't know how bad it was. Mm-hmm. You ask, you know, the, uh, a, a protester a few questions about what's going on. And, and if you ask them one question too much, they have no clue what's going on. And I was just, I was in shock to see to see what was going on in the outside world and and how much the world doesn't understand what's truly going on here. And that's why I decided to keep on fighting. That's why I decided to keep, you know, keep posting even more to, to you know, right now I'm, I'm going to the US to, to talk to communities and into Canada as well, hopefully. And the war isn't, isn't over also in Gaza, but it's only, it's only started here on social media, like the world doesn't know what's going on in social media only really you know unfortunately helps uh, helps the other side what is the answer because we live in a world 
where I'll say the controversial thing. Followers does not equal intelligence. Mm -hmm. But we live in a world that gives credibility to people with followers. So when you go on X or you go on Instagram and you see accounts with 100,000 plus, 500,000 plus, posting certain information, it's almost impossible to blame a follower to, or blame a follower for believing what they see. Because if you're being pushed out the same message over and over in your own echo chambers, like, how do we break through that? How do we break through the echo chambers? And what does it feel like to you who is holding this truth inside and you're fighting, you know, to bring to, like the light to this truth that it's not in fact what it's being exposed to be? I don't blame, blame them. I don't blame the followers. I don't blame the average, you know, white or black or Asian person who has no clue about the war they side with the Palestinians because not only is most of the world posting about pro-Palestinian things or anti-Israel things, you know, the Wall Street Journal did that that uh, that study where they just opened 10 random accounts. I think 60 or 70 percent were already smashed with like pro-Palestinian or anti-Israel, um, you know, feed. So I don't blame them. I think that the answer is, is to do what the Palestinians are doing and to speak to communities that aren't of their own to go to the, the black churches, to go to the Asian communities, to go to the Christians, to go to the, 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 that middle ground over there who, who kind of doesn't know what's going on because that's what the Palestinians are doing and we're not. And to be honest, our PR isn't the best. Like the Palestinians have these, these like catchy, catchy slogans like, from the river to the sea, Palestine will be free. Like, it sounds good to be honest with you. And what do we have? In 1948, you know, there was a partition plan, they didn't accept it, you know, we're always explaining ourselves and defending ourselves and what the Palestinians are doing, they just do a, a much better job. So to answer your question, I feel like what the solution is, is to do exactly what they're doing, to, to, to not just preach at the choir, to also get to those celebrities or major influencers and try to get them to post maybe on our side. A lot of people are scared. You know, you have them like Rappaport's the world who aren't scared to post and lose followers. But when people have a platform and their followers want to see one thing, they're more inclined to post that one thing, like you said, just to keep their followers. And it's wrong. So I think we need to bring people to Israel. I think we need a birthright for major influencers to come to Israel to see what's going on. I'm not saying to dismiss all the Palestinians who have died, you know, War is sad, there's death on both ends, and not every single person that died on the other side, on the Palestinian side, was related to Hamas. But we don't have even 1% of the, you know, of the, the, the media time that they have, and we need it. Did you believe in peace before October 7th? Yeah, I mean, look, once I was released from the army, I worked for an Arab Christian from a, a place where they don't really love Jews, but I saw who he was, I saw how much he respected me and how much I respected him. And you know, I could call him right now and he would come to, to, to pick me up and tell him, even he's in the North. I believe that the only way to peace with the Gaza Strip, with the Palestinians, is to get rid of Hamas, get rid of the leaderships that is forcing terror on them. Hamas is brainwashing every single generation to hate us Jews, to hate us Israelis. And until that stops, we're not going to have peace. There's no two-state solution. There's no maybe, no, we're going to be neighbors. There's none of that. We have to get rid of the, we have to get rid of the root of the problem for us to be able to get somewhere to peace. Because if each generation learns to hate us more and more and more, how are we going to achieve peace? I believe there's a path to it. I believe it can be achieved, but not the way that, that that's going on right now. If we eliminate Hamas, who is next? Because Hamas is being funded by Iran. They're just a proxy. Do you not believe that there will be another proxy leadership at some point hidden in Gaza? I'll go after teaching data. Yeah, I mean, I don't think that the, the, the only problem is that there's going to be another Hamas 2.0 or another Islamic this or a Palestinian that. Hamas is also an ideology. 
it's not just a terrorist group. So we have to get rid of that too. And who knows how long that'll take. But I do believe that, you know, with the world, many countries in the world do want peace in the Middle East. I know that Israelis do for sure. If we're able to at least replace the leadership, I think it's always going to be terrorists, always. But if at least the leadership, the ones who are deciding what goes in schools, how the Ministry of Health information is, is provided, and all this, these important things, and it's actually a democratic uh, solution versus you know what's going on right now, um, I believe that even with those terror groups, we'll be able to be in a much better position than we're in today. And then we got to take out organizations like Unra, and thanks to people like Hill and Moyer, uh, if we can succeed in doing that, we can succeed in essentially their funding. We can take out of their funding. Yeah, even when, when we were in Gaza, like the whole world thinks that all this humanitarian aid and, and all this, you know, UNRWA donations go directly to the people. And they're not. And this isn't me saying it, this is the own people saying it. We, I remember going into one of the, the terrorist houses and you had a huge storage full of all this food. It was like enough food for maybe maybe 500 people. There's no way one or two or 10 families could eat this amount of food. And I saw with my own eyes that Hamas takes all of this aid and pays to themselves. And it says, you know, flour provided by the UNRWA for the Palestinian people, for the Palestinian brothers. And it just didn't get to them. It didn't get to them. And that, that's the issue. You find a new UNRWA jacket and then beside it you find a, a weapon or a radio, a grenade or a map. And you, you don't have to be a genius to, to do one plus one. October 7th changed everything for me. Until October 7th, my startup was my life. I was working on it every single day for the past year and a half. But after being Gaz and after coming out, after understanding how, how bad it is, I knew it was bad, but like how bad things are around the world, I decided to just putting my life on pause and going and continuing fighting. And right now I'm dying to go back to Gaza and to join other units who will take me. But a lot of reservists have been released over on a peace deal. You know, I don't feel comfortable sitting here right now. And it's not you, and it's not it's not Kiel, and it's not the, the the university. But being here, when I know that I have friends who are still fighting at war, and there's still hostages being tortured and being raped, and who will probably be killed if they're not brought back, I don't feel comfortable continuing with my life the way I was before. And that's why I've made the decision to go to New York, to go to the U.S., to go to Canada. I keep telling my story until I'm either back in Gaza fighting the war or until the war is over or until, you know, we have more people on our side. I, this has totally changed my life. I didn't think that after an MBA and after living a year in New York, I'm going to be, you know, going around the world and talking to communities, everything from, you know, smaller synagogues to, you know, hopefully big non-Jewish communities, but I have to keep on fighting and I, mm -hmm. I I can't just, I can't go back to normal life. A lot of people focus on the past and what's going on and all that. I can talk about the wars that every single war, you know, 15 wars, we didn't start them. They were started by others, okay? The reason that we have checkpoints in the West Bank is the same reason you have checkpoints at the airport because you don't want terrorists to come in. Mm -hmm. You go back to the partition plan where we wanted to split the land basically 50-50, and, and, and the other side didn't want. There's like so many angles, depending on who you're speaking to, whether they're a historian or whether they believe in the Bible. I, I try to focus on, on, on right now. Okay, so stuff happened in the past. It's sad for both sides. Today, like we in Israel, we're not leaving. You want to live with us? Great. Let's talk and see how we can move forward because just like we're not going back to, to Poland and kicking everyone out of where we used to live, no one's going to kick us out. Before the war on October 6th, we had 15,000 air workers coming in. Instead of coming in and working and living a normal life, they were collecting information and passing it back to the Hamas, which led to the attack. So Israel isn't going anywhere. You want to come live with us in peace? Let's figure out a way. Don't start bringing up things that, you know, we did in the past, because I can promise you I can quadruple 
the number of things you say by showing you how many times we were attacked. Mm -hmm. 100%. We've created such normal, like, normalcy in such unnormal conditions. It's not normal to have a rocket, you know, on your farm. It's, it's, it's far from normal. It's, it's, it's crazy what, what normal is for some people. And you just reminded me of, of, of something. Well, last night there was a siren. I'm not sure if you heard it, but every siren that I experienced was either on base or, you know, I, I was in Gaza, so I didn't hear the sirens. I, I saw the rockets being, being shot. And yesterday I was babysitting my, my nephew, he was five months old, and the siren went off. And I, I didn't know what to do because I, 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 I've been in sirens before, you know, I, I, a couple of years back, but I just like, I was a bit in shock and I took this like little kid and, and for him it's normal because he, he, you know, he can't speak. He lived throughout this war and he went to the bomb shelter, you know, time after time again. But for me, it was super weird. It's like, this is normal for this kid that in the middle of the night or when he's sleeping or when he's eating or when he's whatever, he's playing, he's, you know, picked up and ran to the bomb shelter. And I like, I call myself for a second, you know, I ended up taking a, a selfie, a mirror picture, but like. It is just to, to remind me that like this this normal shouldn't be shouldn't be normal and all the stories of, of what you said what I said of you know people in Zderot you know uh, this morning my friend that I'm staying at he told me since the war started I have a pair of shorts with the key in it because my door locks automatically so I just run out grab my shorts and I go to the mud it's like that's not normal mm -hmm. but it is. Did you ever have a life or death moment where you got you, just, you found yourself in a situation, firefight or whatever it may be, and you said to yourself, "This might be it." I said to myself that a few times, definitely. Um, I think it was on the third Friday we were in Gaza. Uh, we were in the second story of a building. My friend and I were guarding, and you know, I, I turned to him and asked him a question. And before he could even answer it, we heard this like big boom and we realized an RPG was shot maybe a meter away from us and it, it was kind of like a video game almost you know like everything was like shaking there was dust everywhere shots are, are, are being fired you don't know what's going on and we're just you know crawling to, to the room and everyone's you know one person saying shoot one person saying hi and it was a huge mess and then you, you're getting shot at like you're actually getting shot at you see me Feel the bullets, you know, you, you, you hear them, they're exploding right beside you. And um, the difference between active duty soldiers and reservists is that reservists, they've lived longer, so they have much more to come back to. And when you're in active duty, you just, you're, you're a soldier, you're more like a robot, I'm gonna go and I'm gonna, but as a reservist, you think twice. And while I knew we were getting shot out by terrorists, who knows how close they were, we thought, okay, let's think for a second before we go out and, you know, let's collect everyone and then we'll, we'll return uh, fire or do whatever we have to do. So we thought before, and I think that that's uh, one of the things that saved my life in that situation. If anyone thought this wasn't real, it's real. And yeah, you go outside and you see where the RPG hit. And luckily it was the, the, the concrete part of the building. It was in between the, the non-cocky parts. And I feel like it was from God, honestly. But um, it was a scary moment. And had a few more times when you, you're you being shot at. It's not a paintball gun. It's not a, it's not a you know, a, a BB gun. You're, you're being shot at. And, you, you know, all of a sudden, the, the, the heavy backpack that you're running with, that, you know, slowing you down, all of a sudden, it feels weightless. And you can run and you can run. And... Uh, <laughs> Yeah, I'm not gonna scare my mom anymore because she'll probably watch this video. But uh, yeah, you know, and you watch like, these movies it's like American Sniper, or Lone Survivor, and you got the soldier who comes comes back from the Middle East off to her for a little bit, and replaying these kind of moments. Sort of are these like the moods that I've re-put in your head? I mean, on the day to day, no. I think that mentally the this Hasbara stuff, this Instagram stuff that I'm doing has been str has strengthened me a lot. There are other soldiers in my unit and, uh, and other units which may think differently and, and, and do think differently. But I think you know, I, I deal with this all day. So I'm looking through the pictures. I'm, I'm looking at what to upload when I'm talking, when I'm interviewing, when, when I'm just, you know, out there. 
it's a lot of things that that do remind me um of, of stories in gaza of things that happen you know whether it's even un unintentional things you know i was with a friend who on her phone case she had something that it, it like shocked me because it reminded me of, of, of something i saw in gaza and i was like you know it, it was it was weird um but i'm not uh i'm thankfully like mentally i'm i'm I think I'm strong and um, I wrote a journal in Gaza that I, I, I made sure to write every day and I, I haven't had the strength to open it yet because I think that you know those stories will come up but um, when I'm ready I'm, I'm going to do it and maybe I'll publish it. Hopefully you publish it. Well listen man, like uh, thank you. That's all I can say, thank you. That's, I'll, I'll tell you, that word has changed for me. Thank you. I, I was going over at Senna, to the south. I was there last week, and a soldier said to me, thank you so much. And I'm freaking like, no, my man. Thank you. And it was like, and I'm sure you've heard of that advice. Both of his parents were unfortunately murdered. I went to the Shivar, and we're talking for a quick second. And you guys thank me, wishing me a long life. And I'm like, there's something wrong with this situation. I'm like, I, that's just the epitome of Israel and Jewish people. It's, it's, it's unbelievable. So thank you. Really, really took a lot of them. Off the record, on the record. Yeah. Like, I, oh, I just one of, of many soldiers and, uh, you know, we're, we're all part of this. Mm -hmm. Like, just cause I'm in the physical world doesn't mean that your part or, or Gil's part or, or anybody else's part is just less important and honestly. The physical war, we can win. We know it. You know, we're much stronger than Hamas, and that is the strongest army in the world. The way that you're fighting the social media war, much harder. Mentally, I'm telling you, you experience some things, but you you guys are the ones that are exposing the truth of the world, and and um, you guys deserve a huge pallet back because you're in Tel Aviv. You should be you know, enjoying life and eating at the best restaurants here, and you know, meeting people and uh instead you're taking your time going to visit the south and you know help me get my story out so um, i'm making it my life mission right now to just go and speak to to everyone everyone wants to hear whether they agree or whether they don't the hard questions the soft questions the easy ones i if you would have asked me you know five years ago would you imagine your life at 32 i would say in tel aviv you know, probably married with kids or working at a great startup in a great community and being able at 7 p.m. to come home and spend time with my family and enjoy life. But it's not like that. So right now I'm living out of a suitcase. I'm single. I'm going to go and just just go on this mission because we have some people doing it, but not enough. And I feel like with my story, it brings another angle. And I don't think that Noy Leib is personally going to end anti-Semitism or is going to, you know, change the view of the entire world. But I do believe that, you know, I'm going to go make a difference and that's why I'm doing this. What's your one message to the world outside of Israel, outside of the Jewish communities? We don't want to be here. We didn't start this war. We don't like this war. I'm a civilian, my friends are civilians. We want to go back to our normal lives. We want to enjoy, we don't want to have to worry if, uh, you know, how close is a bomb shelter? And on Google Maps, I looked and there was like restaurants, bars, and bomb shelters. And it's like crazy to think about that. We want to go back to our normal lives. And we, the Jewish people in the state of Israel, we want peace. I'll say that again for the people in the back that didn't hear, we want peace. But we need someone on the other side of the table to want peace as well. And that's the core issue is that we're dealing with, with, with an organization, if you want to call it, that doesn't want peace. They want, us, they want to wipe us off the map. If, they're going to, if they want them, they're going to try and do that. We're going to defend ourselves. And that's why we are who we are. And let me start. Let's go. Yeah.